afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Green Mountain Care Board. First item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report. Susan Barrett. Yes, thanks, Mr. Chair. I um, just have a couple of reports that I wanted to announce, report submissions that I wanted to announce. We um, at the board have several legislative reports that we need to produce and submit to the legislature. Um, so recently on December 1st, we submitted a social service integration report that was per Act 52 in 2019. And that act was um, looking at relating, that act was related to social service integration within Vermont's healthcare system. And that report is posted on our website. I encourage folks, especially very relevant to the ACO because it looked at the integration of social services into the ACO. And I don't like to call out too many people personally, but I know Melissa Miles, our um, deputy director of ACO and All Pair Model, as well as Sarah Tewksbury, did a, a lot of work on that report. So thank you. Um, on January 1st, we will be submitting the impact of prescription drug costs on health insurance premiums report. This is this is the second year we're doing this. Um, our last year's report is uh, posted on our website, and of course this year's report will be posted as well. And then January 15th seems to be the day that the legislature asks for reports for, from several different agencies, so I'll just quickly run through these. So we'll be submitting the primary care spend report. We're doing that work in conjunction with our partners at DIVA. We will also um, be uh, submitting the cost shift report that's embedded in our annual report. The Rural Health Task Services will be submitting their report, right Robin? Yes, <laughs> I actually hope we might submit it a little early, but we'll awesome. see. Awesome, we'll that's see. awesome. And then of course our annual report from the Green Mountain Care Board to the legislature. And again, embedded in that annual report is information on the expenditure analysis. So I wanted to just make sure folks in the public and uh, the board is very well aware of these reports and our staff, but please do take some time to check these out on our website if uh, you are interested. That is all I have to report, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, 12-11. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, December 11th, without any additions, deletions, or or corrections, is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Next on the agenda is the benchmark proposal, Sarah Lindberg. Good afternoon, my name is Sarah Lindberg. I'm a health services researcher. For the Green Mountain Care Board. Yeah. Um, so, uh, in the interest of uh, trying to increase some clarity, I thought I'd just uh, spend some time level setting about how this all works together before we get to the proposed vote. Um, so, I just wanted to point out that there are a lot of financial targets that we talk about. We're talking about all this stuff, so. There's a difference between a financial target between the ACO and a payer who's participating in the model, that's a very specific relationship, versus the targets that we have model-wide. So for the all-payer model, we have a separate set of targets. So for each payer, they're going to have, for each year, a target. So Medicaid comes up with a target with one care. Blue Cross Blue Shield comes up with a target for one care. The Medicare benchmark is where the target is set between the ACO and Medicare for the year. So it's a, it's a very discrete part of this big uh, machinery. And um, those are only, or those are limited to people who are attributed to the ACO. So this is truly the population that they're taking care of. Versus the all-pair model is a much broader look at um, delivery system reform. So they have three main kind of pillars of targets. One has to do with scale, which is the number of people who are participating in an ACO. And you know the model doesn't say there's only one. There theoretically could be more ACOs. So it's the number of people attributed to ACOs in Vermont, or Vermont residents attributed to ACOs. And uh, those targets are for both the statewide or all-payer population. 
uh, and also a subset of just the Medicare beneficiaries. We also have some targets around quality, which I am pretty ignorant about. I know there's a lot, and I'm so grateful to people that are experts on that, but some of those are also for our statewide Vermont population, and some are limited just to those who are attributed to an ACO. Not, not one care, but an ACO participating in this model. Um, of which one care is one. <laughs> um, and then we have uh, financial growth, which is the one that I, I talk to you the most often about. And um, we have two different targets there. There's the all payer, which is how statewide, across Vermont, our expenditures are growing. And then just for the subset of the Medicare spend. And this has nothing to do with um, necessarily being attributed to an ACO. So they're very different ways that we are thinking about these targets. Um, so these, these contracts also probably often have quality measures in them and um, maybe some reporting requirements. So there's other conditions in there besides financial targets. Um, but that's going to be different how it's neg negotiated in most cases or arranged with the ACO. So um, when we think about just the financial part targets for this all-payer Vermont-wide deal, um, for that statewide target, we think of our all-payer growth target, which is for the life of the agreement, and that's just saying our average growth between um, 2017 and 2020, today, uh, should be 3.5% or less. So that's our target today. At the end of the agreement, we're beholden to this growth until 2022, but we just need to see if we're on track so far. So that is our all-payer target. So what is our Vermont-wide spending per person in 17 compared to what it is in 2020? Um, the reason we raise that to the third pa uh, power is because it's three growth periods. No funny math there, 17 to 18, 18 to 19, 19 to 20. That gives you your average growth rate. And that, that target for when 2020 is over, which we won't have the results so close to the end of 2021, that number should be less than or equal to 3.5%. Um, Medicare is a more complicated calculation, but I promise it's not too, too painful, just bear with me. So the Medicare growth is tied to these national projections. So every year Medicare says, we think nationally this is how much Medicare is going to grow in the next year. And our um, target under the model is to be 0.2 percentage points below that. And again, it, it compounds over time. It's always the growth to date. So for the way that works is each year we compare the ACO Medicare um, PMPM in the current performance year to a reference population in the year before. And there's you know, a really good reasons why we can't compare the same people, just mostly because of those death and end of life costs. So if we were gonna try and do the actual growth of the actual people, it would, it would kind of be unfair to the ACO. So we wanna say, given who is actually participating in ACOs, this is how we think that patients attributed to those providers are, are expected to grow. So we do that for, for three different years. So this next year will be how the ACO does um, at the end of 2020 and how that comparison group did in 2019 will be kind of stacked onto this. And right now, um, at the end of 2020, we know our target for just that Medicare group should be less than or equal to 3.75%. So the numbers all kind of coalesce around the same place, but we get there very different ways. <clears throat> So again, the Medicare benchmark is just that target between the ACO and a payer. And the way it works is we set a target, which is represented by the green dotted line here. There's the ACO performance. If it's below that dotted line, that would be where the shared savings come in. If it were to exceed that dotted line, that would be a shared loss. So that's all it is. It's just a target for the expected uh, spending by the ACO in the upcoming year. So right now we're trying to make that um, target for 2020. Um, and because of the way, again, the model is written so that we have to do that for two different versions. <laughs> One version is for people who are living with end-stage renal disease and then the rest of the Medicare, Medicare beneficiaries. And that's because that uh, end-stage renal disease population is very tiny but very expensive. So it's one way to help provide some protection for risk uh, to the ACO or in anticipating ACO. Um, and the way each of those we factor or calculated is um, we just try and figure out what we think the spending is for the current year, multiply that by the number of people who will be attributed to the ACO for the upcoming year, 
and apply a trend rate. And so the board's decision today is what trend rate we should use. And that decision point has to do with what we think growth is likely to be and projecting that forward, keeping in mind these statewide bigger goals that we have for the model. So our recommendation has not changed. We recommend that we use a trend rate of 3.5% for the non-ESRD population. We have a couple of placeholder numbers still here. We're still finalizing the um, estimated spending for the current year, but uh, that should be pretty close to final, we think. And uh, the number of aligned beneficiaries um, is coming from last year's benchmark. Uh, we're expecting it to get those final numbers today for the number of people who actually will be attributed to the ACO for 2020. That trend rate, so that's your decision point, and the projected um, per beneficiary or per member per month um, target for 2020. And we do something similar for the ESRD population. So again, an estimate of the experience, the number of folks we think will be attributed to the ACO in 20, uh, 2020, and then uh, a recommended trend rate of 2.9%. Why not pre-5? That has to do with the way that the targets we're constrained are, are calculated. So that's the maximum allowable based on the data available to us. So um, that population, again, is small and highly variable, presents more risk. So we would definitely advocate for using the maximum trend for that population. And then finally, uh, our recommendation for including uh, advanced shared savings component. So um, don't mean to make that sound fancier than it is. Basically, um, to help with cash flow and help support the work of the Blueprint for Health and um, the SASH program, what we Medicare has agreed to do is um, pay that money up front to the ACO so that they can have that money flow through to those programs. And then at the end of the year, that would factor into the performance. So if they um, you know, save $10 million, they would only get a check for whatever's above that 8.4 million. So they're still on the hook, they're still accountable for that spend, but it kind of helps make sure that those um, programs are continued to be supported. Um, the number did go up a, a little bit, as I told you last week, uh, that number is $8.4 million, and that just has to do with blueprint calculations. So the Blueprint for Health has a little bit of an increase due to inflation, and then the attribution numbers have evolved a little bit. So that's what we think that would need to be paid out for these programs. Again, this is a blueprint for health and SASH thing. Not all these folks are actually gonna attribute to the ACO. It's a, it's a separate thing. The money is being supported and invested through the ACO, but it's not, it's not all ACO lives. Um, so yeah, at the end of the day, that's what uh, the math all boils down to. Um, again, all the, the experience and perspective lives are still subject to change, but that should be in the ballpark of, of where we expect that final benchmark to land. So um, any questions I can address for you? Questions from the board? Okay. Uh, just a question on um, the, the slide of the let one the three years coming up to less than 3.5 percent. When will we be able to get a pro forma mm -hmm. of what this, you know, you know, where we stand? Oh, sure. So um, for 2020, um, I, I generally don't like to say too much until we have at least six months in the books. So then um, I want at least three months of time for those claims to get paid. So that would be spending through June of 2020 with claims paid through September of 2020, and I get that extract around November of 2020. So it's it's pretty close to the end of the year, yeah. And you know, we're, we're collaboratively trying to work to have more recent indicators, more timely indicators, but it's hard because you want it you want it quick, you want it timely, but if it's not very informative, it's it's hard to want to make a decision based on that, but you can certainly get some early indicators and we get reporting along the way and we'll do a better job of um, presenting that quarterly to you guys so you can see where we're, where we're looking. And we certainly will have 19 numbers in our next uh, presentation for you so we can start looking at that. Okay. And just one other question on the, when we talk about the national benchmark for Medicare, can you talk a little bit about how Vermont is starting to really against the national benchmark? Sure. Um, so Vermont's Medicare spending has uh, 
steadily, consistently been quite a bit below uh, national spending. Uh, the growth is a little bit bumpier. Smaller state kind of makes sense there'd be a little bit more volatility in those estimates. Um, but the whole reason, to my understanding, that, that this kind of idea came up is that um, there was a year where Vermont was had a huge growth rate compared to national. And so there was this idea that we are a, um, a low spend but high growth state, and how can we get ahead of that and bend that curve to be more in line with inflation? So um, I have not seen in the data available to me years where we've been a much higher than national. We tend to be below or pretty close to it um, in the past couple of years, but uh, every year is a kind of new can of worms and hard to predict. No, that's good here because obviously we're going a little bit below the national benchmark, so yeah. we typically are unfavorable to that. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions from the board? Seeing none, I'll open it up to public comment. Is there any public comment? Seeing none, is there a motion? I move that we approve the Medicare benchmark with a 3.5% non ESRD trend rate and a 2.9%. ESRD trend rate with 24 million in advanced shared savings for blueprint and SAS programs. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to approve the benchmark with a 2.9 for ESRD, 3.5 for non-ESRD, and including the $8.4 million um, for SASH under the advanced shared savings. Did I adequately sum up that motion? I would say SASH and blueprint, but yes. SASH and blueprint, okay. Got it. Blueprint includes SASH. SASH doesn't yep. necessarily include blueprint. Okay. Any discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? But the record shows unanimous vote. Okay, we're going to transition now to the ACO budget and invite Elena, Melissa, and Marissa now. And whenever you're ready. Okay, I can go ahead and kick us off. So I'm Elena Verapi, I'm Director of Value Based Programs and ACO Regulation. With me, I have Melissa Miles and Marissa Norman, also in ACO Regulation. <coughs> Um, today we'll be find our, presenting our final recommendations based on last week's preliminary recommendations. Um, we have fewer slides for you this week than last week. Um, so since then we've received three public comments, one of which we received this morning, but we reviewed all of these public comments and where we saw merit we incorporated them into some last minute. Um, revision to those recommendations. Um, we've also worked with our legal team and incorporated your feedback based on last week and further conversation. Um, and today we've, and I think part of that conversation was around how to um, best administer these uh, recommendations in a very precise manner so we can follow the deliverables um, over time. So they might look a little bit different, but we tried to note uh, where exactly they tied to in last week's presentation so the public can follow that. But there's no substantive um, content change, it's mostly just clarifications. So today we wanted to start with um, an FAQ. It seems that there's been a little bit of confusion existing um, maybe in the public and other spaces as it relates to all care model and the ACO budget process. Um, so our team is working to put together an FAQ document um, that we will eventually post to our website. Um, but we wanted to take the time to go through a couple of these as it relates to the budget today. And if you missed last week, I just included the um, link here for anyone in the audience. So our first FAQ list is going to start us off. So uh, a lot of people ask questions about what the all care model is and what the all care model agreement is and what is one care's role in the all care model. Um, so we laid out several different bullet points here, and I think it might be just easiest for me to kind of run through them. So the all care model is an agreement between Vermont and the federal government allowing the major healthcare payers to pay differently for healthcare by changing incentives to reward improved provider communication and patient outcomes over, um, over volume. 
of services provided. Um, in the agreement, the ACO is the vehicle to implement the LPAR model, and there may be multiple ACOs who could operate in Vermont to implement the LPAR model. Um, an ACO was uh, adopted by CMMI as a vehicle to um, bring together a network of providers. It's a, basically a legal vehicle to bring together uh, a network of providers. Um, some states have just healthcare providers, some states have social service providers involved. We all, we have a continuum of care in our network in Vermont that come together to be accountable for the health of a population and to work toward the goals of the healthcare model with the state. Um, so an ACO, and in particular, the ACO in Vermont works to reduce care and reduce and um, improve care and reduce costs by allowing providers to bring um, their money and resources together in four ways. So in Vermont, we are looking for population health investment dollars for providers to be able to transform the way that they provide care. Um, they're also providing information, which would be through data and analytics, um, care coordination, and then innovation. So um, in Vermont, we are looking for ways that the ACO is encouraging innovation in care delivery to test out what could become best practices for Vermont's unique population. So as I mentioned, it is possible to have multiple ACOs in Vermont. Um, we have one, and, and that is one care. Okay, so as it relates to OneCare, who's our, our ACO and who want um, their budget growth. So OneCare's proposed $1.42 billion budget reflects a 59% increase in total revenue over um, fiscal year 19. Um, does this budget growth imply an increase in cost to consumers in the state? Um, generally, no. Most of this budget is existing healthcare spending, just paid a different way. The increase in revenue is almost entirely explained by the increase in patients for which one care is now accountable. So this was 160,000 in 2019 and 250,000 in 2020. So this is a 56% increase in attributed lives. And for, to get precise, we would want to kind of look at which lives those are, because some lives are more expensive than others, but generally this is um, a direct reflection of the 59% increase. Um, how is the Green Mountain Care Board monitoring one care to ensure that their budget and growth is reasonable? So, you know, we have this budget process, of course, where we analyze and kind of ask questions across um, how the dollars kind of link to the program um, as it relates to the goals um, of the state. Um, but in addition, we um, generate uh, recommendations that they, that the, or we're doing this year, we have recommendation that um, one care should present on or before April 15th their final attribution revised budget so we can see how these things settle um, once those contracts are final. In addition, um, we carry forward recommendations from fiscal year 19 requiring one care to submit quarterly financial statements and we have, we'll go through those in more detail as we progress through the rest of this presentation. Uh, the $13.1 million in DSR funding, I think there's been some confusion about what this is and isn't. Part of this is just the word to DSR, Delivery System Reform. There's DSR funding, and then there's the Delivery System Reform effort. Um, so I think we have to be clear, and it's unfortunate these things are commingled. Um, but DSR funding is a very specific to um, a grant that flows through from the federal government to DEBA. Um, so we're hoping to clarify that a little bit while we're through this. So why is OneCare asking the state for $13 million in delivery system reform dollars? Where do these dollars come from and what are they used for? I've heard some say that it's propping up OneCare, is that true? Um, so when the all peer model agreement was signed in the state of 2016, there was this understanding that investments would be required to actually make this reform a reality and shift the way we deliver care. Um, so that's, that's kind of where this funding idea came from. Um, and one cares request for 13.1 million specifically at this point in time includes funds for new projects as well as existing projects from and, and represents funds for both state and federal partners. Um, so some of this money in the 13.1 are funds already being received by one care for projects that are in place. So it would just continue um, to roll for, continue to roll those projects forward. So if appropriated by the state, how would these um, funds be used? So there are specific purposes under Appendix 1 of the state's Medicare waiver, which I'm not an expert. Um, so this is under DIVA. Um, but they have outlined that uses for these funds shall be limited to continuing to develop infrastructure to provide better data and information to healthcare providers so they may better serve their patients, 
and invest in community-based population health projects that increase access to primary care, consistency across screening, mental health, substance abuse, this use, uh, decreased prevalence of chronic disease, diabetes, hypertension, and number of deaths uh, related to suicide and drug overdose. So those are the all-payer model um, goals. Another frequently asked question that we get is around salaries and the administrative costs of one care. So the question might be, what value do Vermonters get for the cost of administering one care? Uh, so we look at this in the budget in sort of uh, four buckets. Um, I have on the slide here. So the ACO model provides the legal entity necessary to allow providers to work together to care for their patients. Uh, the uh, ACO provides, um, or sorry, payment reform requires investments in transformative change um, system-wide and by practice. So you need to put money into, administrative money in, in order to be able to administer these changes. And transformative change, when I say that, means things like data analytics, information about practice patterns, clinical practice transformation, implementing care coordination, quality improvement. Um, and again, some of this can be centralized system-wide or it's by practice. So the third one, centralized functions um, are required to succeed under the new models. And if you don't have some of these um, centralized, then they would have to be implemented by practice and duplicated. Um, finally, as we've mentioned Blueprint and Sash several times, the federal funding for these programs is made possible through the all payer model agreement and it's administered through OneCare, so that's another uh, administrative function. <clears throat> so what do we look at, um, or sorry, what is in OneCare's administrative budget for FY20? Uh, as we discussed last week, uh, it's $19.3 million and that represents 1.4% of the proposed budget or total um, money flowing through one care. And there's more information on this in the administrative expense slide from last week, including the, the trends over time. So how does the Green Mountain Care Board monitor one care's administrative costs? There are two budget conditions in our recommendations around this. The first one holds one care to the ratio that's in the proposed budget. This allows for a range to account for potential revenue changes as, the, as it's finalized. Um, and it's based on a Green Mountain Care Board sensitivity analysis to, to make a reasonable range. The second um, recommendation requires one care to keep administrative expenses at less than healthcare savings in the system over the duration of the agreement. This is a condition that was carried over from FY19, and we are still determining how to monitor this requirement because calculating savings includes savings to the system that are long-term cost avoidance and the value of improved health. So we have spoken with consultants and the federal evaluator about how you might be able to calculate this, but it is not something that we can calculate year over year and want to look at over the duration of the agreement, um, but it's an important question, so it remains in the recommendations. Um, as for the salaries, we wanted to clarify that salary information um, was collected from one care is available on our website at the link on the slide on um, hospital Vermont hospital salary information is also posted on our website another frequently asked question is to do about quality and what do we know about quality how do we know if one care is improving quality for patients and providers um, and the short answer is that we don't know yet we only have one year of data under the agreement um, that's 2018 which was presented to you in november 2019 data is not available until about a year from now and at that point under the agreement progress is monitored after year two um, quality measures are in one cares contracts with payers and certainly we're talking about this already um, and there's also the statewide all-payer model 20 quality measures that are separate from the payer quality measures so when the board looks at this we look at it um, in terms of what is reported through the contracts and what is reported through all-payer model reporting and we adhere to the reporting requirements that were negotiated therein so in the budget we collect um, again the payer contracts they link quality with financial incentives, um, and one care also must report provider performance by payer program, the Green Mountain Care Board annually. Um, and this is how we will monitor quality through the process. Um, the Green Mountain Care Board also reports to the federal government on the all-payer model measures that's done 
annually. Um, we will also look at quality through the federal evaluation, um, which CMS has retained the University of Chicago or NORC evaluator who we also talked about last week. Um, and we have monitoring to show population health investments linked to quality. And there's a new recommendation uh, in our um, conditions today around a dashboard requirement to make this information more plain and available to the public. Um, and we will be working with One Care and uh, with input from the healthcare advocate on how to look at that data year over year because the data that you may have seen uh, in public comment or different commentary is um, not statistically comparable year over year. Uh, so we are trying to find a way to look at that year over year, but the contracts specifically say um, quality is monitored after year two when we have 2018 and 2019 data. Great. And I just want to clarify, the dashboard recommendation was new since last year, not new since last week. So we'll, we'll see that. Um, so in addition, so we wanted to, there were a couple follow-up items you asked for, and then we wanted to go through those. They should be pretty quick. Um, so last week, we looked at the budget components broken down by the key expense areas. Um, I think Maureen, you had asked us to look at how to break out the revenue and the funding sources. So you can kind of see now that the payer revenue for provider reimbursement, not just reimbursement, as you would expect, but they're also payer program support, you know, you know everything is quite small as it compares to the overall healthcare expenditures, which mirrors some of those that we were talking about earlier. Um, we have 1.3% from payer program support, 1.2% um, from state support, that includes the 13.1% that has been discussed around DSR funding. Um, then 1.7% from our hospitals, and then you know other grants um, that are in smaller amounts. So this is here for your reference. I just want to make one comment on that slide, because I think it's really important to look at you know, this revenue versus expenses. Um, there was some questioning last week about the potential for one care to be making profits and for those profits to be going back to the founders, things like that. And I can tell you one thing that makes me feel at least a little bit comfortable that that would have a hard time really happening is when you look at the participation fees from the hospitals. So, you know, the hospitals are providing $24.5 million into the system. And the board of managers is predominantly, you know, the hospitals. And so if there's to be a profit made, you know, at the end of the day, you could look at it and say, you know, that, that's where the give and take would have gone back. So, you know, and I think also there's been a lot of questioning about the size of the growth of, of how much the revenue has increased. And, you know, at least when you highlight here and you see the one three the billion three sixty two up top and the billion three sixty two on the bottom, that's a one one pass through mm -hmm. that goes through and that's where the bulk of the increase is. So it's you know, I think it's just it just makes it laid out this way. You can kind of see that a little bit more clearly and line out, you know, that revenue expense and get it to the zero. So Absolutely. You know, for me it's helpful and hopefully for other people who really weren't clear on how that was working through. You know that it becomes a little more apparent when you see it laid out. Absolutely, I think we're going to go through and flag tables and slides that we will try to reproduce year after year, so we can have a comparison point. This would be one of them. Um, so I think another question I think we received from, from two board members is about this 6.04 percent. We did receive um, the support for that, but it's an interview for confidentiality. Um, and then there are also some questions about hospital risk and system level or sorry, we had a slide on system level risk. We had asked for hospital, how it um, correlates with hospital level risk. So we looked at um, uh, maximum risk liability uh, as compared to days cash on hand at the hospital level. Um, and we also looked at it relative to their NPR and FPP, which is straight from the hospital budget process. So that is now there for your reference as well. Um, there was also a comment about, you know, not just looking at the risk, the downside risk, but also the upside risk and opportunity. Um, so I, we put this on there as a placeholder because this is the data that we have available to us right now. But I think what you've heard also is that this is not the only way that we should be measuring opportunity or savings to the system. This is just the contractual mechanism by which 
hospitals can achieve savings. Um, there are also ways that hospitals can achieve savings by becoming more efficient or through you know, effective care coordination at the ACO level. So I think we just want to remember that when we talk about this in the future, that yes, we should look at their contractual risk and opportunity, but it's really much more than that. So I think that's what um, you've heard some of the staff say already, is that we need to return to this, one of our recommendations that we've continued to carry forward about assessing the value of the ACO and really think about um, what, how do we measure that full picture? This is the same recommendation that we presented last week, so that's what the notes on the bottom are about, just that, so you can follow them from the presentation last week. And this is just a more specific uh, 2021 network development strategy. And I just wanted to say a note on this one um, in follow-up to several board member comments and public comment last week, um, that this, um, this is a voluntary provider model. Um, scale will be achieved under the model by pairs and providers joining the network. And that it's the ACO's job to design and implement programs and payment models that benefit providers that are effective at controlling costs, improving quality, and reducing administrative burden. So as we've talked about, it's too soon to tell if many of the cost and quality measures are um, proving successful. However, we can look at providers who are choosing to join the network or not. And so one thing that this um, recommendation does is allows us to track you know, new providers, asks the ACO to be more specific about providers dropping out and why and the challenges that they're having to network development um, to help us understand um, how providers are feeling about the model, what's attractive about it, um, and so we hope that uh, this will be more helpful to better understand. I'm not going to read this word for word, but again, this one is also adapted from the 2019 budget order. It's a carryover, and this is that uh, one care has to submit written report to the board on a template that we've developed that demonstrates that the payer programs qualify as scale target initiatives um, under Section 6B, 6B of the APM agreement. And uh, if they create new payer programs, they have to submit these to us no later than 15 days. And again, this may have had some wordsmithing, but it's a carryover from last year's budget order. <clears throat> this first one is a uh, asking one care to submit a one-page document sum summarizing the benefits of self-funded payer programs, or the benefits that, that self-funded payer programs receive by participating in one care. And this is just to add to um, informational materials on our payer programs. Um, the, number four is that one care must submit the Medicaid geographic attribution implementation manual to the board once it is finalized with the Department of Vermont Health Access so we can better understand uh, the new Medicaid geographic attribution methodology. Okay, so we'll have to try to breeze through these, but this uh, number five is a, is a reflection of last week. I'm not sure it even changed much except for um, some very small wording, but it's basically the 3.5% that you just voted on um, and the 2.9% of ESRD for the Medicare benchmark. Um, for Medicaid and commercial, the language is similar to last year since we don't have those rates yet. Um, we'll have to return in the spring, but here are the contingencies at the time. So then we have um, the number six, which is about the maximum amount of risk that um, we would allow one care to pay out um, to, based on its payer contracts. Um, this is a rollover from the 2019 budget order. Um, number seven um, is about uh, asking one care to report on the scale target memo that we posted to our website. We talked a little about that last week, and so this is um, just a more precise way of referring to that memo, but it's otherwise the same. Um, number eight, um, we have asked, I think this reflects past practice um, and maybe a little bit in more detail, asked one here to come back later than April 15th to present to the board on the following topics. Um, a lot of these showed up in last week's presentation, but we wanted to consolidate them here so we could know exactly what that presentation would look like. Um, and in addition, we added a couple extra things um, to that list. So you can follow where that was adapted from last week's presentation, but among some of these things, you know, attribution, peer contracts, a revised budget, um, final description of their population health initiatives, hospital dues, hospital risk. So we just kind of want to come back and, and make sure that we're headed in the right direction and that we don't need to tweak our budget order. And then a 
along with that is a requirement to provide all of the documents to support that presentation two weeks in advance of their presentation so that we can um, have some time to look at it, analyze it, and ask any questions that might be relevant. Um, number 10 is uh, the same recommendation that we had last week. Um, you know, it's based on a sensitivity analysis that we performed, um, but kind of anchors one here to their current budget in terms of how much administrative costs we um, will permit or will think is appropriate. Um, and then, you know, based on what the final attribution numbers come in, um, I think we should take a look at this again just to make sure it makes sense um, and have a conversation about that. Um, and then one care must implement its risk model as it's described in its budget. So we just want to make sure that if there are any significant changes to one care's budget, that you know they let us know and keep us in the loop so we can consider that relative to all of our other regulatory processes with the board. And finally, before I pass it on to Melissa, um, number 12, this is about the $4 million in reserve. Um, and I believe it was pointed out to you there's a little typo. It shouldn't be 11C, it should be 12C. Um, that happened as we were renumbering these recommendations. Um, but this $4 million reserve should be you know, used only for population health investments and helping um, hospitals on sustainability plans um, kind of enter the all care model and then any temporary cash flow issues that might occur. Otherwise, we would expect that one care would come back before the board um, to explain any uses of these funds. Okay, so for budget recommendation number 13, as Elena described before, One Care will be providing their final budget information for the board in the first quarter of 2020, which includes their population health investments. So this um, says that if their population health investments are not fully funded as presented in their 2020 budget to us this fall, we've asked them to come back to provide a proposal for the board to consider that describes any funding shortfalls, changes in programs, um, programs that would be affected by attribution, and to provide an analysis on that, on those changes. Um, this mirrors, uh, although a little bit more specifically, um, Sarah Lindbergh's uh, previous presentation around the Medicare dollars. So we're continuing to require one to provide at least um, 8.4 million to the Blueprint for Health for Blueprint Attributed Lives uh, for Medicare for 2020. And um, this number is based on prior years plus an inflationary rate of 3.5 um, as described previously. <coughs> so for number 15, um, we have always had one care report quarterly on their financials and, and other information quarterly, but we're codifying it here. Um, so in addition to the financial statements, we're also asking for information on the population health investments by health service area, program and provider type. Um, we're also asking for information on their 2020 complex care coordination program since that's changing significantly and we're looking to hear about implementation, enrollment, and any potential changes and opportunities. Um, this is adapted from a recommendation that we provided last week. Um, the board uh, must is asking one care to use its community specific quality healthcare investments to address cost and quality differences across health service areas as identified by one care in their variations in care analyses. And um, the board is asking one care to use that, those variations in care analyses to support its decisions for quality investment specifically. And then um, we're asking for a report by April 30th, 2020 that documents this approach. This is a long one, but it did not change from last week. So it's basically asking uh, one care to provide a work plan to evaluate the effectiveness of their population health investments. Um, and you know it includes who's receiving the funding, what the project is, what the outcomes are, and any issues in the implementation of those projects. Okay, this is also a pretty long one, but we presented on it last week. So it's basically asking one care to provide a, a performance dashboard and a proposed plan for that implementation. Um, so the board will work with one care to determine what that um, required form of submission is, but it will include population health and financial data by health service area, um, and we'll speak to how they're meeting their projected fiscal budget and population health targets. 
So as Marissa spoke to earlier, this, um, this has been in our budget order for the past two years. And so over the duration of the health care model agreement, one pair's administrative expenses must be less than the health care savings, including an estimate of cost avoidance and value of improved health that's projected to be generated through the model. So um, we plan to, over the course of this year, um, determine how we'll operationalize this uh, as we are starting to see the 2018 data in full form. Um, there are many qualitative measures that we'd like to also be considered in this when we're considering the system level changes and the value to the healthcare system. So we're currently working with our federal partners who are conducting the federal evaluation and other experts to ensure we are following best practices as we refine this measure and we will provide progress on this later um, in 2020. And finally, numbers 21 to 23 were also in the prior budget orders. Um, when we're still finalizing their 2018 financial audited statements and we've been told they will be delivered when final. And slide with next steps. Um, we presented about this last week. Yeah. Um, we're just, it's exactly what we said last week, but you know, today we hope that you will vote on these recommendations and then once that has been decided, um, we can start producing the budget order um, and then start developing the monitor, continue developing the monitoring plan. So, um, we'll leave it there. And ready for any questions you might have? Or comment and question. Um, and uh, just to emphasize what other folks have said here is, um, I, I, I think it's important for people to keep in mind what this is. And if you go to the all care model in the second paragraph, you'll find that it says that CMS, through its Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, to test innovative payment and service delivery models that are expected to reduce Medicare, Medicaid, or children's health insurance program expenditures while maintaining or improving the quality of beneficiaries' care. So technically, the agreement says this is a test. Um, it may work, it may not work, um, but we don't have any idea about that because we're just kind of a third of the way down the road. And um, But I will say um, that by in looking at the revenue growth associated with this test, that people, um, you know, whether it's hospitals or federally qualified health centers or or, um, or others are voluntarily, there is no coercion here, are voluntarily signing up uh, with one care. And I don't think um, folks from all walks of life in healthcare in Vermont, um, including insurers and providers, would be doing that if they didn't see something beneficial to this test. So uh, sometimes I think this is like, you know, the fight that Ben and Jerry's had with uh, Pillsbury, um, when they said, what's the dough boy afraid of? I don't know if many of you probably aren't old enough to, <laughs> to remember that, but that was where uh, Pillsbury was trying to push Ben & Jerry's ice cream off the shelves at supermarkets. And I, you know, um, um, I have a feeling here that, you know, there's some folks, and I've been around government for a long time, that I know are just uh, opposed to, to government. And, and there are others that are single payer diehards um, but this, to me, is an effort that um, the state has undertaken um, with the federal government. It is a test. Uh, participation is voluntary, and I think that we should keep that in mind as we go forward. I had uh, just a couple of comments. Um, one, it, it, along the lines of Tom, I just wanted to also say um, I think it's also important for us to think about the, the national context because we are not in this alone. And what we heard uh, in the spring at our rural health uh, panel with uh, the national expert who, go, who basically works with providers all around the country to, to, to figure out how to transform uh, and maintain a sustainable business model given all of the federal changes what we heard in the spring was that uh, the federal government is moving away from fee for service and providers who are not uh, working on how to transform themselves into a value-based organization 
are the ones that are seeing the greatest sustainability challenges. There's also, I think, challenges uh, for anyone in trying to transform a large system um, in that that's certainly hard. And I think that, uh, at, to your point earlier in the slides, is, in the FAQs, is reflected in the fact that there was recognition that operational transformation requires upfront investment. And if there isn't operational transformation, then quite frankly, then nothing is going to improve from where we were in a fee for service system. So I just wanted to make that point. Um, in terms of evaluation, I think it's incredibly important to be consistent with the federal government. The federal government ultimately will be the arbiter of evaluating this model. Uh, CMMI always evaluates their own model and they determine whether they think it worked or didn't work. I, I think it doesn't do a service to Vermonters or anyone else for us to be inconsistent in evaluation with that federal model because quite frankly, it just increases confusion. So uh, that is something that I think we need to keep in mind as we move forward in developing dashboards and other uh, items and I think I think our staff understands that. Um, I also think it's very important if what we want to do is emphasize prevention and wellness and health over sick care to try and capture uh, foregone costs or avoided costs. Uh, one of the challenges I think we've had in our state and in our country is that we have not seen the benefits of focusing on prevention because we don't focus that far enough in advance. You will not see the benefit of a prevention in one year. Uh, you're gonna see it many years out. And so I think to the extent that we keep that in mind, that needs to be factored in. Otherwise, uh, I think we're doing a disservice to uh, prevention, public health, and all of those uh, areas that we think are important for upstream investment in people and people's health. Um, uh, the, other, the other thing I, I wanted to just say is I, I think I, for a couple few years, have been very frustrated with the way that data flows um, in the model, as I think everybody is. I mean, everybody wishes we had uh, upfront totally complete, totally accurate, immediate data, but that's just not the way it works in healthcare. So uh, I'm, I actually really like this process that we developed last year where we uh, have what I think of as kind of a true up in the spring when we know the actual attribution, we have final care contracts that we can analyze. Uh, because I think that if, if we were to wait and do the budget after we had those things, we, everything would be, to use one of Tom's phrases, in the rear view mirror. And so by doing the budget now and providing these guardrails, if you will, through our conditions, I think that that helps to shape uh, the payer contracts, and, but then allows us to come back and evaluate those once they're final. Uh, so none of those were questions, but I just wanted to make a, a couple of points uh, related to things that I think are captured in the recommendations and are important considerations as we move forward. Other comments from board? I'll just be quick, but um, I just want to thank you, all of you on the team, and also Sarah Lindbergh, who's out there. We, I didn't probably thank you when you were out there. Um, but I know how many hundreds of hours have been spent pouring over documents, digging into data, trying to get us to where we are today. And I'm really appreciative of that. That was a thoughtful set of recommendations, I think, that took into account the healthcare advocates' comments, public comment, each of our concerns. And I, you know, it's been a long journey, and many, many, many hours, but I just want to thank you all. Thank you. Uh, other comments from the board, Tom? I just have one other ob observation, or two, um, very quick. One is I just want to reiterate um, that I think that the QHP benchmark plan is a significant source of premium money that now flows uh, in accord with the ACO, and that that benchmark plan, uh, going back to 2014, may be, and I say maybe, a little bit out of date and not fully in accord. Um, I know it's not one pair's domain, it's, it's uh, 
Diva's domain and uh, the, uh, the board's domain, but I think one care might look up look over the fence um, at that opportunity because it's $300 million plus uh, in, 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 in premium uh, uh, expenditures. And the uh, other area that I'm a bit concerned about and will be keeping an eye out uh, has to do with affordability. Um, the ACO is an association basically of payers and providers um, and, and insurers. And I worry that um, if and this is totally hypothetical, if uh, the ACO really does work well and there are shared savings for providers and insurers and all the participants in the ACO, um, but if we kind of continue in the world, in the world of the cost shift um, and, and its impact on insurers, and I, at, at, at the last meeting, I talked about the last four years of Blue Cross Blue Shield having $2.2 billion in revenue, and only uh, $3.4 million uh, in, in margin, um, that if, if the insurers, uh, if, if, if that relationship doesn't get squared away, there may not be shared savings for insurers. And if there are no shared savings for insurers, that uh, will have an impact uh, on what they can do and what we can do during rate review. So um, I always remind myself of Walter Carpenter's comments at these meetings don't forget about premiums, co-pays, and deductibles. And uh, in order for Blue Cross Blue Shield or MVP to have an effect there, they need to have shared savings. And uh, that will be much more highly probable um, if the cost shift is something that is addressed uh, in our healthcare system. Other comments from the board, Maureen? Uh, yeah, I just want to make one comment on, you know, there's obviously been a tremendous amount of work that's gone through the, this process, and I wanted to thank, you know, the staff. And, you know, I also want to say that there are a lot of conditions in here that need to be met. And, you know, we really want to understand, you know, whether this is going to work or not. You know, I think, you know, we're regulating this. It comes to us. and. And so we don't know yet whether this is going to be successful or not. And I think what we're trying to do is look at a lot of measurements. I mean, there's been a lot of questions to the board almost of, well, the board's just approving all this. And I don't see that as the case. I mean, I see that, you know, we do regulate the ACL. We need to have them come forward. And we need to approve, look at what they're doing and see if we approve it. But more so is putting on a lot of conditions in order to be able to measure whether this is successful, also understanding that it's going to take time to be able to see results or not, right? But you know, we'll be able to look back and say, did we were we able to bend that cost curve? You know, but it's going to take a few years for that to occur, and so you know, I think we do have to be patient and, and see how this works. And I think we're putting up a lot of the things that we'll be monitoring to be able to watch that. Um, as we go forward. So I just want to thank the staff for everything they're doing behind it. Thanks. Any other board comments or questions? So I just want to say that um, it's a fine line that we walk because we do not want to create a system that creates additional administrative costs through um, placing burdens much like what we hear from doctors all the time, the administrative burden of running their practice. So we have to be careful that what we ask for is not going to create a burden that uh, makes it even harder uh, for the practice of medicine in the state of Vermont. I think that the most important work that your team has in front of you in the coming year is the dashboard. Because the only way that you grow a coalition of the willing is a lot of people have to want to believe that it's the right thing to try to um, improve quality while containing costs and transforming the way medicine is delivered in the state. So I don't think anybody is going to argue that the status quo was working prior to the all-payer model, because we know it wasn't. So the real question is, how do Vermonters feel comfortable with making changes that, as Tom said, may or may not work. And the only way that they're comfortable making those changes 
is knowing that they're going to be able to see the results. And so there has to be transparency and there has to be accountability. And that's really what the dashboards will provide. And I was really grateful to see that you place the healthcare advocate into that process because we often see some great points of view that we may have overlooked without their uh, feedback. So um, with that, I just again want to thank you for your work. And at this point, I'll turn it over to the public for comments or questions. Walter. I guess I'm going to go first here. I have a couple things. Um, first, I want to thank Tom. He was thinking exactly what I was thinking about affordability and the co-pays and the deductibles. I don't see that changing with ACO. Co-pays, deductibles are ways for insurers to ration care, to keep profits and their bottom lines up. And I don't see that changing with the shift to value care at all, whether you keep you know, whether you keep premiums the same, lower them, that's not going to change with the ACO. And that's the vast problem because access is the problem. Um, Tom was talking about affordability and I wanted to pick up on that. And uh, I wanted to know how many employees the ACO has that equal $19.3 million in salaries. The thing I'm thinking here is that it's the public and the taxpayers who pay for this, and most of them don't get benefits. Most of them don't have retirement plans or anything like that. And we're subsidizing the ACO. Um, another thing is what's going to happen when they want another $13 million next year after this, um, or whatever figure. I know the board, as the chair said, is walking a very fine line. So those are comments I have. The second thing is, is that a lot of the public that I talk with is getting kind of iffy about it because a lot of these Medicare and Medicaid dollars that we pay are going into this private company and they're getting very nervous about that. So that's my comments there. Okay, are there other public comments? I think on the side of these, um, 19.3 million is their total administrative costs. I mean, that's not just salaries, just just from a, their, their salaries in there, but it's, it's not all 19.3. I just didn't want that to get misquoted somewhere about 19.3 million in salaries because they're right. It's not a 11.8 in salaries and benefits, and I believe it's for 77 or so employees, but I have to confirm that. And you did provide a link, didn't you, to the chart? Yes, the link is on the first or second slide. So. <coughs> Dale. In terms of what this is going to end up being, I think it's a novel, and I keep thinking of this, the, the book I read, Brave New World, but after some other books. So this is a serious comment, but it's a little lighthearted too. Um, I keep wondering which one of you is going to write the book, the ACO generation in the year 2035. But it actually makes sense. When you're looking for what will this do, it's that far down the road. It's the kids of today that are three, four, five years old. It's the things we do for them. It's the things we do for our teenagers. It's the things we do for those that are dealing with substance abuse as parents and those children as they grow up. It's um, what everybody has to deal with in terms of the younger generation, when those of us that are older are gone, they not only deal with what we tried to do for them, they're going to deal with what we didn't do for them. So there's an even greater economy of scale in terms of what is my premium going forward? What is my cost of everything going forward? So I, I'm, I keep playing with this in my head. Every comment I've heard makes sense. But I'm just saying it's so true. Somewhere in there, somebody needs to publish something or something 
and really get this into the perspective of, but what we're really doing is looking at the year 2035. Just, I'm throwing out a figure. Um, that's amazing. Because if you said something like that in the 1960s, you're a liberal and very much not in the crowd if you were trying to look that far ahead, because that was really a now generation. The fact that we are looking that far ahead is innovative in itself. It's a hard sell, but it's innovative, and I think it's the right direction. Thank you, Dale. It's one of the problems in the world that we live in is when you address social determinants for health, you don't get a one or two year return on investment. It's a much longer time frame. Yeah. And I, I can tell you that I'll volunteer to write the book, but I'm going to be on the same time frame as my buddy Cam, who told me when I first took the position in 2017, his book was coming out shortly. <laughs> 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 Any other public comment? I'd just like to respond to Walters a little bit and make a, a kind of an apples to oranges comparison. So don't take this too far. But you know, when you look at the administrative budget of the ACO, it's at 1.3% of expenses. You can go to the um, JFO's website and look at DIVA, which runs an insurance program. Um, and uh, there, and there's a specific appropriation by the legislature for administration there, and that's at 171 million dollars. And in the last three or four years, it's been 12 to 14 percent of the total operating budget for DIVA, you know, including the program for beneficiaries. It is an apple to oranges comparison because DIVA has issues with uh, long-term care, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can go through the rate review process and see that Blue Cross Blue Shield very proudly says, you know, that their administrative expense is 6.2%. Um, so I just kind of throw those out there with some distant benchmarks, uh, but neither of those will ever get to the place where the ACO is, which is down to 1.35%. Okay, other public comment? Yeah. I still think that people really don't understand what the ACO, real, the, uh, the uh, one care amount of the ACO really is and what it does. What Robin said was that the whole engine here is to shift from shift from uh, people service financing to capitation or some kind of block financing where you can get, like Gaxic, where you can absolutely guarantee that you can suppress the cost uh, pressure to rise too rapid, to rise too rapidly. What I think is very poorly understood is you can't do that. You cannot move from fee for service to capitation without an ACL. There isn't any way to do it. So if somebody doesn't want to do an ACO, you don't want to have an ACO, you don't want to have one care, then what you can do is you can just get rid of it. You can get rid of the one care, and what will happen is you go back to full fee for service, and what you do is you go back to what we have to be had for. 50 years since the middle 1960s, where the inflation rate in healthcare spending runs four, five, six, seven times the underlying rate of inflation. And when you do that, then when Tom worries about all the cost shift, you'll just take the current cost shift and you'll multiply it by four. So the, the, the idea that, you know, this is some kind of a terrible beast out there is really just ridiculous. Okay, other public comment or questions? Seeing none, is there a motion? Sorry about that. Uh, I move that we approve one care's budget with the 23 conditions as outlined by staff, including uh, corrections for any typographical errors. Second. Second. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Let the record show it's unanimous. 
Is there a second um, motion that would have to uh, be made as far as making some type of acknowledgement of the certification? No, I don't think any vote is required for certification. We can take like our that your understanding. That's correct. So uh, the rule says that the CO is certified until it <coughs> takes action on the way. There, there's no more. In which case, thank you very much for all your hard work. It's just beginning. Thank you. Yes. So, we'll get us started. I'm Kate O'Neill, um, and I'm here with Lindsay Kill. We're staff at the Green Mountain Care Board, and uh, we are part of the analytics team. Sometimes we refer to ourselves as the A team. Um, so, we, I'm going to um, talk through this uh, uh, higher level overview and then I'm going to give the meat and potatoes over to Lindsay to talk about um, the proposed analytic priorities um, that uh, we want to share with you today for, um, for your consideration. The Green Mountain Care Board, as um, you know, is the steward of several data resources, uh, including vCures, which is Vermont's all-payer claims database, and um, VUDS, which is Vermont's uh, hospital discharge data set. And we use the data in analysis for the, the Green Mountain Care Board, um, as well as to provide these data to uh, ag other agencies within the state of Vermont and researchers in Vermont as well as outside of Vermont through data use agreements um, where folks are interested in questions around um, lots of different things, but including um, access to care, um, healthcare costs and expenditures, um, patient utilization and quality. And we also provide broader access to more aggregated information right on our Green Mountain Care Board website. Uh, there's a section of the website for data and analytics, and right from there, um, uh, the public, um, you can access uh, reports that we have um, prepared where, um, where, where we look to um, address some of the most common questions about healthcare in Vermont. Um, they're all on the Green Mountain Care Board website, and I encourage you to take a look at them. And I want to uh, just remind you to point out that, um, that when we talk about uh, the development of analytic priorities, we're basing that in, first of all, the statute that, um, that guides our work um, around uh, our all-payer claims database, which is 18 BSA 9410, and outlined in that statute, uh, there are some some duties that we are charged with um, in using and utilizing that um, database, including determining the capacity and distribution of resources, identifying healthcare needs, um, informing healthcare policy, um, evaluating programs around patient outcomes, and comparing costs and the like. We also uh, have a data governance council that's a committee of the board. And um, through the Data Governance Council, the Green Mountain Care Board um, adopted a um, data stewardship principles and policies. And within that, one of the policies states that the Green Mountain Care Board um, data will support timely, consistent, and actionable analyses um, through setting analytic priorities relevant to recommendations that were provided to us in, um, in the Green Mountain Care Board analytic plan. And the analytic plan was um, prepared for us uh, through a contract back in 2012. It's still relevant, um, and it addresses, I mean, I guess I would say the sort of the, the thesis of that um, plan is um, recommendations that the Green Mountain Care Board construct a, um, a foundation of information to support board and, um, policy analysis evaluation and decision making. And so to that end, um, the, the extent of, of the A-team's work is really to support uh, the board in its policy analysis, um, evaluation, and decision making. So uh, the A-team has um, a whole host of ongoing work, um, including the stewardship of our data assets, 
uh, as I, I talked about um, earlier, and we do that largely through the Data Governance Council. Uh, we also manage uh, a number of analytic contracts, including our contract with OnPoint Health Data, which is um, our data aggregation and consolidation vendor for our all pair claims database, or BCURES. Um, Mathematica, um, which provides um, uh, their, our analytic contractor for the all pair model. Um, and there are a number of other contracts, large and small. Um, we provide data feeds for other state agencies. Uh, we are working on the Health Resource Allocation Plan, or HRAP. Um, that is uh, a requirement in statute, has been a longstanding uh, report. Uh, and that um, is, uh, that addresses uh, coordinating interagency data integration, providing um, a health resource inventory, and um, compiling a uh, healthcare needs assessment. We also, you heard a lot about um, the all-payer model, um, uh, um, federal reporting um, that we do uh, around quality measures, total cost of care, and scale targets, and, um, and so Ms. Sarah leads um, the work on that. And um, we provide reporting support for um, other reports uh, that the Green Mountain Care Board does, like the expenditure analysis, um, as well as ad hoc requests like um, what 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 do we what do we know about um, the loss of, of data um, because of uh, self-funded um, uh, employers um, you know, um, ERISA plans not um, reporting um, to be curious um, any longer total cost decomposition uh, de decomposition analysis as well um, and so as we sit in our meetings and we talk about our work and um, where we're going over the next number of years um, in helping um, support the Green Mountain Care Board, we have basically two core questions that we come back to. How can the A-Team provide better information to support the board, its staff, and the public um, and address frustrations um, around access to data, timeliness of data, and the quality of the data that, um, that you do have access to. And knowing that there are many, many interesting and important questions to answer, where do we focus? So uh, to that end, we engage in a process to um, try to begin to address those questions. Um, and we developed some uh, preliminary uh, recommended um, priorities and a timeline for looking at how we might address those priorities. And I'm going to turn over to Lindsay to walk you through that. Thank you, Kate. Um, so like Kate said, um, based on our core questions, um, we uh, led some surveys, the staff led surveys um, for e with each board member individually, and we did that to glean an understanding of each board member's individual analytic priorities. Um, after those interviews, two themes really emerged um, from all the individual members' input. The first theme was around process improvements for the materials that our team provides. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of the presentation, but um, the one that we'll spend the most time on here is um, point number two, the analytical and uh, reporting priorities. That um, these are common themes that all board members mentioned, and um, so we took time to call those and then synthesize them. And so this presentation is the first time that um, we are presenting back to the board our staff's synthesis of everything we heard, um, along with a timeline and um, uh, the, met the ways that we would deliver that data to you. Um, so. Out of those conversations came four um, what we're calling projects. The first three are really um, research projects, if you will, taking these larger policy ideas and bringing them into um, more specific questions, um, hypotheses-based um, projects. And we want to talk about the purpose of those and what we think they'll inform and some proposed timeline. The first one is a patient origin analysis. 
The purpose of this project would be to describe where patients come from, um, their hospital service area, and where they go to receive their care, the hospitals and the hospital service areas um, that they uh, travel to. We believe that this project will inform the hospital budget review, the ACO budget review, and the health, res the health resource allocation plan, which Kate mentioned earlier. Um, all of these projects would be, um, if adopted and agreed upon, they would become recurring reports. So you see here that we're proposing the first iteration of that be due quarter one, 2020. Um, and then any edits would be made, approved upon for quarter one, 2021. Um, and that would be in time to support hospital budget review. Um, so that's project one. Project two is a price variation analysis. The purpose of this project would be to measure any difference in price per service across hospitals. Um, this project would be used to inform the rate review and also the hospital budget review. Because of the scope and the complexity of project two, um, we are proposing to have it be due in two parts. Part one would be a data validation project where we would combine uh, and compare the VCURE's administrative claims data to the BUDS hospital discharge data. Um, and that would be due by the end of quarter three, 2020. Um, that first part we feel would really speak to um, the degree to which there is um, variation and uh, absence of data um, in the claims. We know that claims, we don't have claims for everyone and we don't have all claims for all of the people in the database. So we want to be able to quantify that for you, especially when we start getting down to per service line variation. Um, so then part two, the actual analysis of the price variation with that measure of how much we expect that we're off, um, that would be due at the start of quarter three, 2021. Um, project, excuse me, project three, also a big one, um, would be the integration of regulatory decision making in data. This project would really be a proof of concept project. The purpose would be to analyze the impact of the Green Mountain Care Board's three regulatory duties on the healthcare utilization and cost for Vermonters using a specific episode of care example for the proof of concept. And that um, episode of care is to be determined. Um, we believe that this would inform hospital budget review, ACO budget review, rate review, and the age rack. Um, so really all aspects. Um, and again, because of the um, both the scope of this project and also because we've heard a lot um, of interest in the first two projects, patient origin analysis and price variation, we are proposing that this, that this project be due at the start of quarter three, 2021. Um, project four stands out a little bit in that it is not um, a specific research project with a set of hypotheses. Rather, this is more of a, um, a course, if you will, to enhance the shared understanding of VCURES and BUDS data. Um, this course would be um, offered to all of the board members and other end users for these data to help them understand what data are available in the two data sets, the limitations, so all the caveats that you would expect um, and some that you wouldn't, and the advantages to each data source because there are lots of advantages um, and we, we want to tout that. Um, we think that this would inform, again, hospital budget review, ACO budget review, rate review, and certificate of need. Um, really, anything that the board has questions about, um, understanding um, to the best that they can uh, what is in the data sets will help us build questions and build um, um, hypotheses that we can answer successfully and accurately. And we're proposing that that is due quarter two, 2020, um, but offered on a regular basis, um, semi-annually maybe, uh, but certainly at least annually, um, really based on individuals' availability to go through the course with us. Um, and on the last slide I have here, just a visual representation of the next two years. Um, it's, 
eight quarters, which when I laid it out like this, I was like, well, that's not a long time. <laughs> um, but this is kind of, this is the proposed timeline. Of course, any of this is, is up for edit and we welcome your suggestions. Um, but this um, helps space out uh, according to some of the um, priorities that we heard, also helps space out and put these projects ahead of certain regulatory obligations that you all have um, and makes it a little bit manageable. Um, but again, this is all proposed, so we're really interested in your um, feedback and suggestions. And questions? Are you, yes, thank you. I, are you envisioning the um, data class to be a board meeting or a smaller settings? Um, that, I think, would be up to however you all wanted to receive the information. Um, if you wanted to all do it together, I think at a board meeting would be great. One-on-one, um, -on -one potentially, um, might allow more time for more detailed questions. Um, but I would leave that up to you all. Thank you. Tom? <clears throat> On um, project number two, price variation analysis, uh, I mean, the relationship across um, hospital service areas and hospital pricing is certainly interesting and important, uh, but also um, how that relates to independent practitioners um, in within each um, hospital service area and across uh, hospital service areas. Um, just so uh, we all know that some allege and maybe there is a tension there. And uh, you know, I would think that project number two might want to speak to or an analytical approach um, as to whether, uh, whether and why um, that tension exists. Anything else from the board, Marie? Um, yeah, on project number one, on the patient origin analysis, um, we will also be able to have to talk about what costs moved or what procedures moved, because it was kind of talking about patient moving from one area to another, what level of detail will it get in there, and also will we be able to show, you know, historical trends? I mean, when you start to generate this, you know, can go back and be looking at, you know, some prior quarters or prior years to understand is this changing, um, are the same things, what, what's moving out of certain areas and things like that, so we can get some trends on that, you know, we're looking at it. Yeah, I would just ask, obviously you have a lot, you've had a lot of competing requests, so these are the top four that made the, the list. I'm wondering what didn't make it to the list? What did you consider that might decide not enough resources at this time to go forward on? I brought that list with me. <laughs> um, Quantifying all wasted spend in healthcare and or identifying hospital service areas with high cost and uh, lower outcomes. Explaining the history of healthcare reform to demonstrate where we are now with the all-payer model approach. If not the all-payer model approach, what other options are there? And quantifying those options. Reporting on market changes over time to potentially inform changes in spending and pressure on the competing insurance markets. Based on the total cost of care, identifying what procedures are driving costs per hospital service area. For the all-payer model, can we measure how the present day investments impact future healthcare costs? Those are great projects too. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> so how did you, how did you, what was the criteria by which that long list and came up with these four? Um, the criteria were where there were um, unanimous um, interests, and um, although it may not sound like it from the overview that I gave of those first, really the first three projects, those first three projects incorporate um, really achievable aspects of some of these other questions. Um, I'm going to choose one here uh, reporting on market changes over time. Um, to inform changes in spending and um, the, how that impacts the insurance market. A little bit of that would have to be included in um, the project three, where we're talking about the integration of all three of the areas that the board regulates. 
um, just to kind of understand, you know, what's our denominator? Who are the people in Vermont? And really reporting on that and how that's changing over time. Um, another good example is um, by hospital service area, areas with high cost and lower outcomes. When we look at patient origin and where patients travel to, um, Maureen, to your question, we will be not just counting patients, we'll be counting their dollars. And um, I plan to capture the total spend both by the insurance side and the member share. So where are members traveling and choosing to spend their dollars? Um, so that will help speak to higher cost and then we'd have a per member count so we could do a per member count there. Um, so that there are aspects of these other projects that didn't make it into the plan, the two-year plan. Um, but then also I would add that because some of if the questions that we did not incorporate here are much, much larger questions, I think we all on the team felt like these first three projects are really just the start. They're like phase one of answering these much larger questions that we definitely want to help answer. So. Um, if after this first year or two year period, we do want to try to answer um, some of these larger questions, we have all the, the foundation work in these first three, um, or a lot of it. Awesome. That's going to be great. Thank you. The problem is that we don't want to get information today. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the timeline looks really long, but I understand, <laughs> yeah. the, uh, I understand the amount of work It didn't look like it. a short timeline. <laughs> Um, other questions from the board? Not public comment? Dale. It's a two year timeline, but could you, could you make it like a magazine as you pull this together? Could you come up with something like a periodical publication? as an e-book or I'm trying to think in terms of going forward as the information is gathered how do you keep it relevant because it's it's the kind of question that you're always going to be asking but so that as you collect it you're going to have historical data because the data you get now five years from now it's historical or six years, which is relevant. Right. But then what do you do in terms of, so I'm seeing something much bigger here, um, which means how are you going to publish it? We have historical documents in terms of, that's where the periodical comes in. Um, so that you could actually be publishing as you're actually working on it in a sense. I think right now the plan is certain that all of these will be available on our website and that they will be published um, in real time once they're prepared and shared with the board that they would be available um, and definitely that they would be um, recurring reports and they will be updated on a regular basis both with the years of data that become available and the new extracts that we have available to us as analysts. Um, and we are working on how to go from what most of these projects are, we call them descriptive um, data, and moving to more inferential and potentially one day predictive data. Um, and I think that perhaps that gets more to your question about how do we keep it relevant, is be, being able to use it for um, more, more powerful um, analytics. But that's certainly in the, the plan and the hopes. Any other public comment or questions? Yes. Um, I was just saying for the, the sake of the hospitals, if we're going to try to incorporate this into potentially into a hospital budget review, um, just to make sure from a timing perspective, um, obviously we're already trying to cram a lot into that budget process and into that preparation and the healthcare advocate questions and the, the Green Mountain Care Board staff analysis and their questions. So. I would just ask that we be mindful of that um, and whether we would truly have the data um, in a time frame that would allow it to actually influence our budgets um, or if it would just be something that we would be asked to look at and speak to 
kind of after those budgets were prepared and submitted, but just to give that some thought as to what that might look like. Um, so not really a question, just a comment. Thank you. Other public comments? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Is, there, is there any old business to come before the board? Could I just say one thing about the Rural Health Services Task Force? So, um, we, meaning me and Agatha, are feverishly working on trying to get a draft, full, complete draft uh, slide deck of which will be our report uh, completed to put out for com public comment uh, early next week. So I don't want to give a specific deadline because it may take us longer than we think, but uh, my hope is that we'll get it out early next week for public comment with comments uh, due in the new year given the short time frame with the legislative deadline. So we'll Monday at 7.30 a.m.? <laughs> yeah. We'll post that on our website, Robin. Yes. And we'll, I, we, yeah, this is our work. last meeting of the year, mm -hmm. so that's part of why folks in the audience can spread the word that those will be out. We'll probably get a, a bunch of the stakeholders are part of this process. So we know. also have an interested parties email right. list, so we will certainly email that information out to the list that rural, that of people who have expressed right. interest in rural health, but I figured I'd say it out loud. Um, just if people are looking for it on our website, on, when you're on the home page of the Green Mountain Care Board, on the left-hand side, there's a link to committees of the board. If you click on that, you'll see a link to the Rural Health Services Task Force, and all of our meeting materials are posted there. Great. Any other old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Second.